Um, and frankly, how do we also understand what we can let go of measuring because we can understand what's real and what's not and where investment and cost makes sense versus where it doesn't. Like as a client, I'm just not able to accept some of the billings that we would have even five or 10 years ago because we are seeing both internally from Plus Company but other partners just getting more efficient at it. In an ever-changing world that's all about staying connected, building connections, and seeing where the next collaboration takes a marketing campaign. From an initial brief to the follow-through, what paths are going to make a campaign success more than a possibility? Hi, I'm Brett Marchand, CEO of Plus Company. This is Partners in Possibility. As the digital landscape continues to expand, Obtaining crucial data from niche markets becomes progressively costly and challenging. In the pursuit of maximizing return on marketing investment, or ROMI, marketers focus their efforts on crafting campaigns that not only meet consumer needs and expectations, but also generate profit margins. In this episode, Kristen Wozniak, SVP of Customer Success at Plus Company, and Andrew Rusk, VP Marketing at Coast Capital Savings, delve into the pivotal role played by AI in the quest to maximize ROMI. Together, we discuss how AI accelerates the content creation process, affording marketers more time and resources to concentrate on quantifying and measuring the brand's impact. We'll also provide an exclusive sneak peek into Plus Company's groundbreaking innovation, AOS. This remarkable tool seamlessly connects all touch points in your marketing strategy, continuously monitors creative performance, and empowers your business to thrive in the digital age. Stay tuned to discover how AOS can unlock what's possible in your marketing endeavors and redefine success. Andrew, maybe I, I start with you. Um, you're a marketer. You've actually, interestingly, been on both sides, both the agency side and, and the marketing side. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the challenges that, as a marketer, that you face and that marketers in general face when it comes to figuring out, you know, how do you spend your budget? How do you figure out what's working and what's not working and why that's important? Thanks, Brett. One of the largest challenges that my, my, my team and I have always had is making sure that we're grounding our strategies and our business in outcomes um, and outcomes that ladder up to um, the board scorecards of the businesses that we are driving. Um, so starting with the board KPIs, how do we make sure we understand measurement frameworks um, down from there in terms of what are the key drivers that we need to activate and pull in order to help our businesses grow? Um, and as you get further down into the business, understanding and being able to measure the effectiveness of that becomes fuzzier and harder. Um, and so as we can get better on media measurement, um, that, of course, allows us to make better calls in terms of having, um, having better outcomes at the bottom um, so that we can have better conversations as we figure out where to prioritize investments um, at the top of the organization. And do you do post analysis on campaigns or ongoing analysis to figure out, you know? Oh, abs absolutely. Analytics and data is a core part is a core part of our business. So within within my team, we have an analytics and measurement and insights um, team um, and function. Um, and not only that, but we also tie that um, that data into um, the larger data lake that we run as an organization in order to make sure that we are combining the insights that we are able to glean from our marketing communication strategies um, to inform larger insights on what is working versus not. Right. And I, I presume that one of the one of the challenges, because it's true for every brand and every marketer, is how do you allocate and or put priority against building the Coast Capital brand, in, you know, in, in order to welcome people into the into the brand of the community that's Coast Capital, but then also how do you allocate to actually drive conversion and outcomes, as you say, um, you know, to get people to sign up for a, a new account and or get a credit card or get a mortgage with you. It's right, but, but everything should be driving outcomes, Brett. And I think that one of the challenges in the, the media industry we've had is not having the confidence, um, not having um, the talent oftentimes both on the client side as well as on the agency side and not having the data um, in order to advocate for the role um, that advertising has at creating margin, right? When we get right down to the role that as brand builders we all serve, this isn't about selling products. It is about creating 
brands and experiences and margin creation um, that can help consumers fulfill needs and experiences. Um, and you work with lots of clients that do that in the private sector in order for the outcomes to just be making money. Um, but we also do that in terms of thinking about what the social purpose yeah. ends are um, as one of Canada's largest B Corps. Um, and so like us thinking about how those pieces connect is, is critical and core to our business. Because I think that too often, um, one, we just we don't understand the the basics of marketing effectiveness and marketing science in order to build those cases internally, where this isn't something that can just live with a department in an agency or a specialist on a team. The foundations need to be part of our practice as as marketers as an industry um, in terms of in terms of like level setting and upskilling on the talents that like. If my CEO is asking me to defend a business case, I n can't be talking about bullshit like share of heart or brand love as opposed to the outcomes that I'm driving and how the work that I'm building is contributing to contributors of preference and choice that is driving my P&L. Yeah, well, you could probably talk about those things, but you might not be the VP of marketing for much longer, <laughs> <laughs> which is always the challenge. Speaking of measurement tools, Kristen, well, how do you think this the evolution of the, the digital landscape is is impacting how these models are being used because I know you you know you you're you're doing this work with clients every day. I mean, a lot. <laughs> I think there's I mean there's a number of things that have happened in the measurement space in the last couple of years um, that impact it. But I want to take I think a step back to set something up to explain where I think where I'm going, which is fundamentally right now in the world we live in, especially when it comes to everything with marketing, if you can't measure it, it very rarely gets priority status, whatever it is. Right. So whether it's something like regions, you know, measurement right now in Canada, especially prioritizes national. And then if you get to provincial level, you get BC, Ontario. And when you get in BC and Ontario, you get Toronto and Vancouver. That's it. Mm. You know, and fundamentally the city level, a lot of measurement lives at Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, if you're lucky, Edmonton, Calgary, Montreal. That's it. And apparently right. prior times yep. don't matter at all. And, and, yeah. and the reason for that, of course, is a lot of these smaller regions are 20,000, 30,000, 100,000 people. You know, having any kind of measurement in those markets is incredibly expensive. And the ROI on that investment isn't there for people who run measurement programs. Um, so, you know, Andrew, we talk a lot about local news. We talk a lot about, you know, supporting the regionality of Canada. Measurement doesn't exist in that way, which makes it really, really, really hard. Um, and that goes for a collection of different things. It goes for regionality, it goes for EDI, it goes for TV and offline channels, which I'll come back to. It goes to brand versus performance. It's way easier to measure the impact of performance or lower funnel media than upper funnel media. Um, and so all of these things kind of get the short shrift when it comes to what we prioritize and where we put our dollars. Because if you can measure it, it's way easier to justify putting your dollars behind it. I would say, one of the things that's happened is especially with you know our Google and Meta and our Apple friends across the board, they control so much of the digital data and that digital data informs so much of the measurement and the modeling and whatnot. So over time, everything that they're they're running is prioritizing their inventory and their channels. And it's not a malicious thing. That's just that's the data that they have and they use it and they share it. Um, so I know you're asking about the digital evolution, but for me, the biggest thing is just that as the digital world continues to become bigger and bigger and bigger, and actually that conversation even between analog and digital is like, what's digital versus analog anymore anyway, um, you know, it's every, the, the priority continues to be consistently always, how do we use digital more effectively? Um, and that's the thing that's the biggest impact for me. I mean, even there's obviously a million different ways to talk about it, but that's the thing that comes up consistently. It has been for the last 10, 15 years, and it's just getting worse. Yeah. And we talk a lot about bias and brand protection, et cetera. I mean, let's be honest, these, these massive digital media players are biased towards spending on their platforms, right? So, so weird, right? I'm always shocked at how often giving more money to platforms is going to solve all of my business problems. <laughs> As we look at the power of AI o over the, the, the course of the last six months in terms of what it's going to offer in terms of processing and synthesizing the patterns and the correlations in different sets of data, um, I, I think we're just at the beginning of this incredible time of saying, how is there incredible efficiency in how we measure? How's 
there incredible integration as how we how we measure? Um, and frankly, how do we also understand what we can let go of measuring because we can understand what's real and what's not and where investment and cost makes sense versus where it doesn't? And I think that as we do that um, and we look to the other opportunities where AI will accelerate pace in terms of you think about content production um, and, cre and creative asset production as well, more from a production side, how does that open up additional time um, for us to return as an industry um, to what we, we have always been about, um, which is about being able to measure and quantify the impact of brand on business. The other interesting thing about AI, especially for a, a brand and a company like Coast Capital, is as it gets more powerful, you know, one of the powers of AI can should be sometime in the future also helping consumers make decisions to choose you over, uh, you know, one of your competitors. I think AI in helping to help consumers choose preferences makes makes a lot of, it has op so much opportunity. Um, as a social purpose company in B Corp, we look at AI as a much larger opportunity though. Um, because if you look at um, open AI as a company, um, as a capped profit company that is ultimately designed in this world of if um, artificial general intelligence is able to deliver on the promises that uh, it might be able to deliver, um, what does that mean to work? Um, what does that mean to dignity of contribution in society? Um, and what's fascinating is the way that ha open AI is structured is um, as a capped profit in order to theoretically be able to start fueling a conversation on universal basic income if that technology is successful. So as a social purpose B Corp in the banking industry, um, we care very, very deeply um, about how that integration connects. And one of my largest concerns, Brett, and one of the places where I think the Plus Company and Coast and other clients that we're working on is making sure that we are advocating that Canada becomes a country where we are known for the things that come out of our heads, not just the things that come out of the ground. Um, how we make sure that AI is an ignition and a fuel for growth and for Canadian businesses and industries, it's so much deeper than saying, is my digital media working? Um, and I think that there's a real opportunity as we realize efficiencies um, in a lot of the places that have been core to the traditional PLs of the agency model, where like as a client, I'm just not able to accept some of the billings that we would have even five or 10 years ago, because we are seeing um, both internally from Plus Company, but other partners just getting more efficient at it. How do we find those opportunities to reset um, our ambition on what brands can accomplish together um, into the future? Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. No, 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 here, here, I agree. Um, it, that's an interesting pivot point to talk about the consumer, I think, and tracking customer journey, understanding customer preference, understanding, you know, how they go about their purchase journey, I think is one of the really interesting futures that I think our, our industry and marketers are going to go in. Um, what are some of the biggest hurdles at taking a consumer journey approach to marketing, advertising products and brands versus the sort of MMM top down or, you know, less touch multi-touch attribution up approach? I think the first thing is comfort and familiarity. Um, we've developed a collection of approaches to measurement and thinking that are very much ingrained in the way we work now. Um, and I'd say the number one conversation I have when it comes to, to AI or even just changing or improving or introducing a new form of measurement is hold on, but I don't like, I haven't seen this before. So one of the things is, is just fear. And a lot of KPIs and OKRs are based on the measurement systems that work. So it's like, hold on, you want us to talk now about a consumer journey in a different way, but I've anchored all of my objectives on this. And, you know, my budget depends on this, my bonus depends on this, right? And that's something that the digital world did for sure is, and this is something that I'm incredibly passionate about, is it equated a digital ID with a human being. And your device ID is not you. It's a representation of you or some of the things that you do. But humans are far more than their web activity. Um, humans are full of biases and contradictions. They're unpredictable. They make illogical choices all the time. Um, and so the measurement that we have in place right now as an industry doesn't really allow for that. 
Um, and even when we get away from MTA or Last Touch, and then you move into the MMM world, which is meant to be a little bit more cohesive um, and more representative in theory, the assumptions that go along with an MMM, the people-based assumptions are kind of crummy. Things like it assumes that people react, that every person reacts the same way to a channel. So we're all going to react the same way to TV. It assumes that the channel will always operate the same way. So TV will always have this effectiveness and this efficiency. And then it also assumes that that will never change. So, you know, all three of us are going to react to TV in this way, and we're going to always continue to react to TV in this way. So that's also not how people operate. So I think one of the real beauties of moving towards AI and a true consumer journey is to actually start to honor the nuances that make us people and integrate that into the way that brands can actually connect with people. Because the way in which we're working now creates homogeneity in personas and it you know can reinforce stereotypes. Um, it doesn't allow for all of those things that actually make us us. So looking more at the consumer journey, I think, in, in a way where we actually start with the person first and like a real like actual for real person first, not the other ways we've talked about it in the past, um, will allow us to start to explore and connect with different people in the ways that's actually meaningful um, and get away from this, you know, environment that feels very stale. Um, I think, and that's our, that's our role. Um, a colleague of mine talks about, you know, media agencies are in fact agents of media. And when I think of it that way, I'm like, we have a huge responsibility here in terms of the content messaging that goes out into the world. We can do better and we should. And looking at people is a real easy way to start that. Sorry, that's my rant, Andrew. <laughs> it was great. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the four quadrant strategy that Coast Capital utilizes to modernize their business through a technology first lens. Welcome back to Partners in Possibility. I'm Brett Marchand. Coast Capital's quadrant strategy is their internal guide that anchors the facilitation of the end-to-end -end delivery of member needs during the consumer journey. Let's listen in. Um, so when we built our five-year strategy in 2020, um, we built our strategy around consumer journeys and understanding consumer needs that we wanted to experience and fulfill upon. Um, and really, we viewed this as us extending our spirit as a cooperative and what that means into the 21st century in terms of if we've always been in the business of empathizing and understanding the needs of the unserved and the undermet, um, then how do we how do we do that moving the for forward in terms of like modernizing our business from a technology first lens into the future? And so what we did is we actually categorized our entire business into four different quadrants that we use as we frame everything that we do internally, um, manage, save, plan and borrow. And of course, there's a series of products and experiences that help fulfill those needs that are around that. Um, but then from there, we've actually built out core journeys and anchor points that help facilitate those journeys along as well, in terms of how that, um, how that continues to work. So we look at journeys in terms of end to end delivery of a member need. And then within that, we look at the fulfillment of it um, in terms of how we deliver that from an employee and a member experience. And then within that, we look at how we execute um, on digital pushes and pulls and messages and integrations and like moments of magic as well in terms of how we can complement and help nudge uh, those journeys along. Um, and while we do, we do two things in that process, we of course have uh, the teams that um, empathize and um, with the needs of the consumers and the employees to map those journeys in terms of mapping um, what those digital experiences and touch points look like. Um, and we have Salesforce teams internally that help us execute those and we work with Cassette in order to help um, execute that um, from a media perspective as well. Um, but the, the, the other piece that as, um, as, as marketers and communicators in the org, we've also helped 
to drive is saying, how do we help facilitate that change um, internally in terms of what that orientation can do um, and what that orientation can do in order to improve the efficiency of how the organization is running, um, how um, how that transition can improve engagement within our teams, um, as well as, of course, how um, how that that transition can help our members um, that we are serving as well. I think that too often um, we get really, really focused on the members uh, without allocating su sufficient time um, or even credit to ourselves in terms of what we can do and need to do um, if we want to drive more holistic business outcomes um, and end-to-end and, and -end as marketers. You know, the power of AI is, is that you could create a customer journey for every single member and any and every single prospective member right you know without violating pii and personal data and privacy um for every single person that that's currently a member of coast capital and or you think could be a prospective member of coast capital how, how would how would ai create you know fill in those gaps um that's a big question i think there's lots of ways i mean one of the ways that we're doing it right now is using synthetic data Think about it. this is the example I always use. Brett, you're probably tired of me hearing it or me saying it, but like, think of the most complicated game of SimCity you've ever seen. Right? You take, you know, 36 million little Sims and put them across Canada or close to 400 million in, in the states. You know, and those little Sims you've trained to operate and think to do all the things that your population would do. And now suddenly, there's not me. I'm not in this data set, but there's someone who looks a lot like me in this data set. Who does what I do, um, and that's how we can start to bring together all these different data sets and create populations using AI. You know, the medical industry, for example, relies heavily on synthetic data because they can create data sets essentially that mimic and track, say, spreads of diseases or how different people might respond to different types of medications or vaccines. So they'll use it, for example, a lot in things like children's medicine, because you don't want to be doing those experiments necessarily on kids, but you need to have a good sense of how these types of medications might work. And that's what synthetic data is good for. So it has applications all over the place. In the marketing world, like you said, Brett, you know, it's not just about coast understanding coast. You can then layer in uh, receptivity to other brands. You could lay in, you know, overall, you know, political leanings if you wanted to, reactions to sustainability, to a whole bunch of different stuff to help you then truly understand your consumer base, your audiences, and, you know, just people in general. Andrew, I know you're you're working with Kristen and with both our Plus Intelligence, but also what we call Project Catalyst or the brand name, which is uh, of the product, which is called AOS, um, to actually do use synthetic data to create customer journeys and understand you know, what decisions to make based on the predictive abilities of that platform. I know it's early days for you um, working with this, but what what do you see? You know, what's its pros and cons for you as a marketer? Where do you where do you see its opportunities? I am so excited about the journey that we are going on um, with, um, with 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 AI with Plus Company, and I, I'm excited for a couple of different reasons. Um, the first one is um, I've been so impressed with the ability to match the agility and the drive that we are trying to create within our organization in terms of looking at how. There are partnerships and integrations across agencies in terms of saying how do we um, how do we get to a um, you know a team coast where we are taking the best expertise um, across the network and really making sure that we're getting sharp on the problem statements and the solutions that we're having and AI is um, and, and this tool is going to be the critical component to being able to drive the value realization of all of those different components, um, including from the perspective of Coast, um, some of those investments in values um, where the, the ROI on values has not always been as measurable as would be ideal um, in, in, terms of, in terms of some of those pieces. So the, the agility and the integration is super exciting. I genuinely think that one of the powers of platforms like AOS and generative AI and how it predicts and helps marketers make decisions, but also how it makes helps customers make decisions is that actually companies that are doing the right things for the world and for our communities are actually going to do better. Let me ask you, Kristen, do you see other CMOs and or brands or companies as forward thinking as 
coast and 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 Andrew around these things? Who, who else do you look at and say, you know, they're they're doing a good job? There are some things that it feels like you can't measure, but you still do them because you know they're the right thing to do, like kind of in your gut. You know, a company that does a lot of that. I mean, everyone talks about Patagonia as being the definition, uh, obviously, of doing things the right way. Um, you know, but my guess is there's not a lot of like the you know they did things like close their stores over Boxing Day week to give their staff a break. There wasn't a business case for that, but my guess is it turned out to be a very good business move for them, right? Um, and so I think there's a lot of challenges with, I have this conversation a lot with a lot of people. A lot of people want to make movements in that direction. A lot of those people don't have the authority or capability to make a big move in the way, say, that Patagonia does. They have people they're accountable to a different level of the organization. And that I find is where so many of the conversations can die um, because they want to do it. And they're so afraid that if they make choices that potentially lean into net zero solutions or whatever it might be, that if it hurts the bottom line, you know, they're the ones accountable. So it's always like, I will do this as long as I know it doesn't hurt business results. Um, okay, challenge accepted, you know, and now we have a solution to that with, well, again, within AOS and and our, our catalyst system, you know, this is where you can talk about optimizing towards KPIs like your business results, because we know we're still living in a world where the bottom line matters. But okay, how do I ensure business results while doing it in the most carbon friendly way or carbon neutral way? Right. So it's, it's not an, an either or it's this has to be the first thing because my business falls apart. I got nothing to do here, but okay. And now I'm going to optimize sustainability at the same time. That is going to change the entire conversation around what we're able to do. Because even if it's not perfect, meaning it's not a totally carbon neutral media plan or approach, it will be better than what it was before. And if everyone makes improvements that way, we'll go in that direction. Um, so, so again, it's all a little bit of bravery though. Uh, and I think there's lots of excitement, engagement, eagerness to have a lot of these conversations. It's really hard to be the first one to do it. Um, and this is where Andrew, I think you know, that does put you in a, in a type of different category of going, all right, I'm in, let's do this. Um, that's a big deal. Well, and as companies like Coast Capital, as you become more successful, Andrew, it's also good because more revenue for Coast Capital will mean more spending in communities and in responsible media, et cetera. So there's a, you know, there's a flywheel effect in this, right? It needs to start at the the top as well, where um, especially with AI and measurement, we've Kelvin, our CEO, has been a real champion of saying, what would it look like if we thought of Coast as a technology company that was grounded in the values of a cooperative as opposed to a cooperative that has to use technology? Um, and if you, you take a values-based lens on tech and then say, how can that help fulfill needs for under or unbanked Canadians, it gets really interesting quickly in terms of how that pivot has helped unlock innovation that you just haven't seen in the cooperative movement um, over the last couple of, of decades. Um, and with AI, um, I, I think we've been just so lucky in order to have a CEO um, that has been vocal and bullish on the technology. And so over the last six months, we've had board, Exco, SLT, and org-wide education sessions uh, with McKinsey and academic institutions and other resources in. Um, we've already integrated it into our internal comms where we, we use AI within our workflows as teams. Um, and I think most importantly, um, we've been really, really focused on saying, how do we empower our teams to test and leverage the technology really with three focuses, um, innovation, um, value realization, um, as well as social purpose. And in terms of finding that combination between them, where it's not just innovation for innovation's sake, it's how is that actually driving a bottom line benefit that is having a triple bottom line impact connected to the purpose, where and if we can make that happen. Thank you for your time, uh, for your insights. Thank you for being a great partner in Possibility, by the way. I think your willingness uh, and vision around how AI and AOs can help both Coast Capital, but also the world around us is really inspirational. And, and I, for one, have enjoyed this conversation and look forward to many, many successes in the future. Thanks, Brad. It's been great. Thank you for listening to Partners in Possibility. 
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Kristen Wozniak, SVP of Customer Success at Plus Company, and Andrew Rusk, VP Marketing at Coast Capital Savings, on how AI can not only power Romy, but also help companies see consumers beyond their digital identity, as well as our overview of AOS, the newest Plus Company intelligent all-in-one system for marketing. In the weeks ahead, we'll continue our conversation about the future of AI and marketing with a renowned digital economy expert. Be sure to tune in next week for part one of our conversation with the best-selling author, professor, and chief data scientist, Abby Goldfarb.